In previous tutorials, we've talked about the mean of a distribution, the middle. We've talked about the variability of a distribution, variance, or the square root of variance, the standard deviation. And now we're ready to talk about the shape of a distribution. And the way that we talk about the shape of a distribution is that we compare it to the normal distribution. So now we need to talk about why is that? What is so special about the normal distribution? Well, it turns out the normal distribution isn't special in the sense that it's rare. Not only is the normal curve common in psychological assessment, it's common in nature. You'll see it everywhere. It turns out that even when variables are not normally distributed, those other distributions have important relationships with the normal curve, and some of these relationships are really deep mathematically. So in a lot of ways, the normal curve is embedded in almost every distribution that's out there. When we want to look at the shape of a distribution, we often compare it to the normal curve and we say, how much does it deviate from the normal curve? Consider these two variables. In blue, we have a distribution that we would say is positively skewed. I'll talk about exactly what that means, but you can see that it leans to the right in the positive direction. How skewed is it? Well, we compare it to the normal curve, which is not skewed at all. So almost every distribution, we can compare it to the normal curve and say, to what degree is it different? If we're going to use the normal distribution as the basis for comparison to all other distributions, we have to ask ourselves why the normal distribution, what's so special about it? One way to think of the normal distribution is in terms of its probability density function. There's some really interesting things about this equation, but it's a bit intimidating, and there are other ways of thinking about it. One way of thinking about the normal distribution is how it arises. I'm going to illustrate this with a binomial distribution. A binomial distribution is a family of distributions that has to do with events that can go one way or another way. For example, flipping a coin produces a binomial distribution. As you know, when flipping a coin, there's a 50% chance of getting heads and a 50% chance of getting tails. Its probability mass function looks like this. We'll consider tails as zero and heads as one. So there's a 50% chance of getting tails. There's a 50% chance of getting heads. What happens if we take two coins and flip them both at the same time and then count how many heads there are? We can get zero heads, we can get one head, or we can get two heads. So the probability mass function would look like this. We could get tails, tails, or zero heads. There's a 25% chance of that. We could get heads, tails, or tails, heads. There's a 25% chance of either, so put them together, that makes 50%. Or we could get two heads, 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 and there's a 25% chance of that. What if we were to take three coins, flip them simultaneously, and count how many heads do we get? What we're doing is we're taking each coin and treating them as a variable, and we're adding them together. So in this case, we have three variables, three coins, and we're adding them together. How many heads from our three different variables? Let's continue on. Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. That is, we're taking 10 coins, we're throwing them on the table, and counting how many heads are there. And this can range from 0 all the way to 10. We can see that there's not a very good chance of getting 0 heads. There's not a good chance of getting 10 heads. It can happen, but it's not very likely. Most likely, we're going to get somewhere around 5. There's a 25% chance of that. And then there are all sorts of other possibilities here. Now, we don't have to stop with 10. We could go to 20 coins, 40 coins, 80 coins. 160 coins. Now look at this distribution. It's still a binomial distribution because we're talking about coins that can be either heads or tails. But we're adding up 160 independent events and it's starting to look like this familiar distribution. The binomial distribution has this probability mass function. I say probability mass function because discrete variables have probability mass functions, whereas continuous variables have probability density functions. This probability mass function may look a bit confusing, and truth be told, it's not necessary for you to understand it to understand the point of this lecture but I include it here for the sake of completeness. The probability mass function has these three parameters. K, which is the number of successes, or the number of heads. N, the number of events. How many coins did you flip? And then P, what is the probability of success? That is, what is the probability of getting a heads in this case, which is 0.5. But it could have been anything from 0 to 1. This fraction here is called the binomial coefficient. It occurs in a lot of different situations. n factorial means n times n minus 1 times n minus 2 times n minus 3 all the way down to 1. So if n were 4, 4 factorial would be 4 times 3 times 2 times 1. The binomial coefficient occurs so often that it has its own notation and it looks like this. If we have n events, how many different ways are there to get k successes? Then we multiply the binomial coefficient times p, 0.5 in this case, to the kth power times 1 minus p, which also happens to be 0.5 in this case, to the n minus k power. 
If we alter the value of k, which is on the x-axis here, it will produce this distribution. When n becomes very large, the binomial distribution starts to look like the normal distribution shown in red. That is, this probability mass function starts to look like this probability density function when n becomes very large. The mean of the binomial distribution starts to become n times p with a variance of n times p times 1 minus p. When n becomes very large, you'll get a distribution that looks like this nice smooth curve, the normal curve. In this case, we had n equals 160, which is pretty large. If we substitute in the relevant numbers, we'll get distributions like this. k, we're going to vary on the x-axis so it stays the same. n was 160 p was 0.5 or 1 half. 1 minus 1 half is going to equal 1 half, like so. Then we have two bases of 1 half raised to these different exponents. When we have the same base, we can add the exponents together. So we're going to get 160 minus k plus k. That is, this plus k and this minus k are going to cancel each other out, and we're just going to get 160. So it's going to be 1 half to the 160th power. That's a very, very small number. But it turns out that this number, how many different ways can you get k combinations of 160, often tends to be very large. Now we're going to take 160 and divide by 2, which is going to become 80 in both cases. And then 80 times 1 half is 40. So with 160 coin flips, we get an approximately normal distribution with a mean of 80 and a variance of 40. If you don't like this notation, we can move it back to factorials like so. The fact that the binomial distribution starts to look like the normal distribution once the number of things added together starts to become large is a single instance of a more general phenomenon that is explained in the central limit theorem. In order to talk about the central limit theorem, we need to do a bit of review. The expected value of x is denoted with the Greek letter epsilon. The expected value of x is the mean of x. The expected value of x minus the mean of x squared is called the variance of x. Sigma squared is variance. Sigma all by itself is the standard deviation. When we add variables together, we'd like to know what is the mean and the variance of the sum. Suppose we have three random variables, x1, x2, and x3. If we add the three variables together and produce a sum, we'll call it s sub 3, we'd like to know what is the mean and what is the variance of the sum. So the expected value of s sub 3 is simply the mean of x1 plus the mean of x2 plus the mean of x3. So the mean of the sum is the sum of the means. This fact is true even if x1, x2, and x3 are related in some way. If x1, x2, and x3 are independent, that is, there's no relationship, then the variance of the sum is the sum of the variances. This is not true if x1, x2, and x3 have a relationship. The formula for the variance when they're related is the subject of another tutorial. If x1, x2, and x3 are independent and identically distributed, that is, they have the same mean, they have the same variance, and their probability density functions are exactly the same, then we say that they are iid, independent and identically distributed. If this is the case, then these three means are all the same, and these three variances are also all the same, so we'll denote it like this. So the expected value of the sum is the sum of the same mean, and the variance of the sum is just the sum of the three variances. In a more compact form, it would look like this. We have three variables added together. The expected value, or the mean, of the sum is 3 times the mean, and the variance of the sum is simply 3 times the variance of the original distributions. Let's take this specific case of three variables to a more general case of n variables. So we have a series of variables from x1, 2, 3, all the way to xn, whatever number that we want. And all of them are random variables, and they're all independent and identically distributed. That is, they have the same mean, same variance, and the same probability density functions. So the sum of n variables is denoted like so. We take each x variable and add it together, and the sum of n variables has a mean of n times the original mean and a variance of n times the original variance. This is the first point of the central limit theorem, but it's not the most important point. The most important point of the central limit theorem is that the sum of n variables has a particular shape. As n becomes large, as, that is, as the number of variables is large, the distribution of the sum becomes ever more normal and it has a mean of n times the original mean and the variance is n times the original variance. But the main point of the central limit theorem is that the sum of a bunch of identically distributed variables is normally distributed. Graphically, we can take a bunch of variables. In this case, we have 10 variables. They're all identically distributed. That is, they have the same probability density function. And if we add them together, what we get is a normal distribution. Now here, I only have 10 variables. That's not nearly close to infinity, but 
you get the point that as we start adding variables together, the sum becomes normally distributed. It doesn't matter how wacky the distribution looks, the sum of a whole bunch of them starts to look ever more normal as we add more and more variables. One of the requirements of the central limit theorem is that all of the variables have to be identically distributed. But in many cases, we can relax this requirement. Under many conditions, we can imagine the sum of a whole bunch of different variables with wildly different probability density functions, and the sum of them tends to be normal. This is not always the case, but is often the case. So what does this mean? It means that whenever you see a normally distributed variable, it's probably the result of the summation of a whole bunch of other variables. That is, most complex phenomena, the kind we study in psychology, is determined by many, many things. And if the variable is normally distributed, we can be reasonably confident that it's the end result of many forces added together. When a variable is not normally distributed, it probably means that there are many different influences, but their influence is not additive. There may be some other relationship like multiplicative or exponential. But many things in nature are simply additive. We add up all the various effects and the end result tends to be normally distributed. In the next tutorial we'll talk about variables that are not normally distributed and that they have a lopsided shape.